world knows something of self-control, but almost always for selfish reasons. It knows the self-denial it will go through for themselves, but self-control of the spirit will always work on behalf of others, and this is the fruit we are to produce. So self-control. I do wonder why I picked self-control, <laughs> but actually I've learned a lot through it. So self-control, it's only mentioned seven times in the New Testament, but we can find evidence of self-control dotted throughout the Bible. And to be quite honest with you, I never really took my notice, much notice of self-control before. And I think that's because I live alone and I don't really have a reason <laughs> to control myself. I just live with my dog and he's too cute to tell off and fall out with. So, and then the other thing is I'm quite past the age of um, youthful passions. So I, th I think I just sort of skipped over it, you know, and you, you know how you do. You whiz past vital bits in the Bible and only really hear what you want to hear. And so that was me. So after trying to exercise self-control these last few weeks, um, it's definitely, definitely been challenging. But I'm thankful that self-control comes right at the end. So I've had a long time to give it a go. So understanding the difference between self-control and self-discipline, I think that's the first thing we've got to do. So self-discipline. Ability to have control and motivate yourself and stay on track. Training oneself for self-achievement. And self-discipline equals good habits over a period of time. Self-control. Self Did I say self-control before? That was self self Yeah, that was self-discipline. Sorry. So... Definition of self-control is the ability to regulate one's emotions and reactions, thoughts and behavior in the face of temptations and impulses. Its struggle is the conflict between intellectual knowing and emotional desiring. It relates to delaying immediate gratification of the senses. Self-control equals good choices and is evident in an instant. So I just want to focus on the last line of the definitions Self-discipline equals good habits over a period of time, compared with self-control equals good choices and is evident in an instant. It can take over two months to form a habit and 21 days to break that habit. So all in, in that effort to obtain self-discipline, um, it can be lost in 21 days if you get off track. However, with self-control, we can make the right choice in an instant, but also in an instant, we can make the wrong choice. It's that self-control that God wants to produce through his spirit. Like I said, I'm definitely not an expert in self-control. I've always been very self-disciplined and self-motivated because I worked at home. It makes you sort of that way. You have to get up, you have to get on. And so that was me, self-discipline. But that's not what God wants. God wants us to have the fruit of self-control. So Paul, he was only too familiar with the struggle of self-control. In Romans 7, 18, it says, For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good that I want, but the evil I do not want, I keep on doing. Paul knew the constant opposition within. I think we can all relate to that. So in Matthew 26, 41, it says, The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And it really is, isn't it? We can have victory if we exercise self-control over the flesh. So let's look back on the whole text to find the answer. In Galatians 5, 22 to 25, which is what we've been studying, it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. 
if we live by the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. So that, the answer we are looking for is contained in those verses uh, that follow self-control. It's an action. Self-control is an action. And it's an action to walk in the Spirit. But it's also to abide and stay connected. John 15, 5. Great verse, I love John 15. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. So we really need Jesus, don't we, to um, stay connected. So by nature we want to be in control of our lives, don't we? And find it difficult to allow God to be in control. So if we abide in Jesus, the Spirit is working in us, and life by the Spirit is not an occasional influence of the Spirit, but a continual abiding state where we are continually alive. It's keeping in step, not running ahead or lagging behind, being in line with, in line with the Spirit. Setting our minds and hearts on the Lord, who is faithful to give us the power to help in all situations. So controlling our thoughts, I think we should start there. Because if we've got our thoughts under control, I think everything flows from that. And it's important not to allow our thoughts to take root. Everything starts with a tiny thought that eventually leads to an action. And if we keep our mind on what is godly, our actions will bear the fruit of the Spirit. Likewise, if our thoughts are ungodly, our passions and desires will lead to the wrong impulsive actions. There's no doubt right now we're going through some difficult times, causing anxiety and worry. Our minds and thoughts can be directed to the wrong source. It's about what if. What if we never come out of lockdown? What if we come ill or catch the virus? What about our children and our grandchildren not being able to go to school? And that's when we need to direct our minds to the God of all hope. In 2 Corinthians 10.5, it says, We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. So learning to resist those thoughts that make us anxious, that take away the fruit of peace, and losing our joy in the midst of trials. In Romans 12, 2, it says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We are to renew our mind by replacing those thoughts that are so destroying, to set our minds on the verses that bring hope and peace. One of my favorite scriptures, Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brothers, Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellent, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things and meditate on these. I found this scripture to be really most helpful throughout my life. And I'm going to tell you a little story. <laughs> and I can only give God the glory for this. Um, about 26 years ago, I had a prayer, and, and that my prayer was that, and I know some of you have heard this before, so I apologize, but I, I know some haven't. So th my prayer was that I would have a great relationship with my mum. Now, don't get me wrong, um, my relationship, with, I love my mum and she loved me, but we were very, very different. Um, my mum was <laughs> quite intense. She, was, she got some lovely points about her. She was generous, um, but she was, I guess, she was very, very dominant in the family. And she'd always been like that. She was a, a businesswoman. And so she took on that role of being, um, I guess, in charge of everybody, even my father. In fact, I don't know if anybody's seen, um, what is it, keeping up appearances. She was a bit like that. <laughs> she, kept, <laughs> she kept everybody sort of under control. And, and I, I found it quite difficult at times. And she wore me out because she, she would visit me every day and she would, it felt like she was always there. Um, and it, it was always something. There was always something. And I just longed to have that nice, um, 
peaceful sort of relationship with the mum. And so I prayed about it, and um, I thought about just looking at the good in her, because she did have lots of good in her. It was just that we rubbed each other up the wrong way. And I prayed about that, and I, I only looked at that. And you know what? <laughs> God works an absolute miracle. I could not see anything wrong in my mum at all. And uh, one of my daughters, I don't know which one, was probably, I don't know, at university or whatever, came home, and I think there was either one or two left. I don't remember. But they came back, and they saw that I, I wasn't reacting to, to my mum when she was sort of <laughs> doing the things she did. And the other one said, oh, she's been like that for a while. And you know what? I never, ever saw those things again. And she was only with me for another five years, but they were the best five years ever. So I just want to encourage you that, you know, if you, if you focus and look at the good in people or, or what is true and think about, you know, what is true? Well, God's true, isn't he? And, and he'll never leave you or forsake you. So I think when you've got these problems in your head, you have to go to this verse and it will, you know, it will, it will sustain you. So looking back and <clears throat> thinking about it, I made a choice, but I never realized at the time I was exercising self-control. But I give God the glory for that. And I thank him for his faithfulness and answered prayer. Now I have three examples to share, and they are making the right choices, controlling our emotions, and dealing with our weaknesses. So the first one is making the right choices. Now, this is one of my favorite Bible characters, so, and it's uh, the prophet Daniel. And he is uh, one of the most remarkable men in the Bible. Uh, for 70 years, Daniel lived in captivity, serving in the city of Babylon. He was of royal blood. He was good-looking, intelligent, and he was about 14, 15 years old when he was taken captivity by Nebuchadnezzar. And he was indoctrinated into their culture um, to study into the study of literature and language of the Chaldeans. But the indoctrination did not take root in Daniel's heart. They were so cruel, they took away his manhood at a most tender age and they tried to control his mind and his body. Babylon was a city full of temptations, especially for the young. It was a city of beauty and splendor and affluence. And part of this indoctrination, Daniel was to be trained to serve in the palace. So the king assigned Daniel and his friends to eat a daily portion of the king's delicacies. Well, this food would be forbidden to the Jews because it was unclean, and it would also have been food and drink used for worshipping uh, the Babylonian gods. So this went against everything Daniel stood for. And it says in Daniel 1.8, But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the king's delicacies. So Daniel made a choice. He purposed in his heart. He was not going to do that. And that was a big thing, wasn't it? For someone that was only about 14 or 15 years old, to make that stand, whatever would happen to him. Temptation must have been great to go along with it, must, to, do, to, to, to not go along with what uh, was out there, to, to stand against all that temptation must have been a big thing for him. In fact, it probably would have been easier to accept this as his destiny. He could have been bitter, and angry. He didn't start a riot or a hate campaign because his freedom was taken away. Instead, he drew from his background of scripture teaching, the foundation that had been laid from birth. It ended well for Daniel and his friends, and after the test of eating only vegetables for 10 days, they looked healthier than the rest of the young men, and they were chosen to serve in the palace. You know, as we go through life, the tests and trials change, but are equally challenging. And it was no different for Daniel. And when Daniel was about 80, he faced the lion's den, but Daniel continued to be faithful throughout his life. 
In Daniel 6, 3, it says, Then this Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him. Another translation of an excellent spirit is the spirit of God more abundantly. I love that. So both kings, Nebuchadnezzar and Darius, recognized the living God through Daniel's example. Controlling our emotions. The emotion of anger and temper is not a good idea to act on impulses and emotions of anger. And sometimes it can have devastating consequences. And Cain is a good example of this. He lost control. He became angry and jealous when he saw Abel was more righteous in his offering to God. He allowed the anger to grow and fester until he killed him. His anger certainly wasn't righteous anger. His anger wasn't provoked, unlike Moses, who struck the rock after the Lord had told him to speak to the rock. Disobedience towards God and anger towards the people, and sadly, it cost Moses dearly. Now, we cannot control what others do, but we can control what we do. So controlling the emotion of love. We will never find ourselves in this situation, but we may be tempted to allow our emotions and impulses to take over out of love instead of allowing the spirit to restrain us. John 11, 1. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus, the brother of Mary and Martha. So the sister sent to Jesus saying, Lord, the one whom you love is ill. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister Mary and Lazarus. When Jesus heard he was ill, he stayed two more days. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him. Then when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet saying, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And when Jesus saw her weeping and all the Jews weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled and Jesus wept. Jesus was obedient to his father's will, but he wasn't exempt from emotions. As we see, he wept and he groaned in his spirit. He felt their grief and pain, and he understands our grief and pain too. He knew the end would glorify God, but getting there was still painful. He knew the outcome, but he still endured the emotional journey. There may be times when we are compelled to help out in love, letting emotions rule instead of the spirit. We may be tempted to jump in to save the day. It could be to help out in many ways before the time is right. God may be wanting to build faith in someone. I'm often reminded of this verse when I face a challenging situation. It's Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, giving glory to God. Self-control is also infused into the rest of the fruits. Without self-control, we will never have patience with others. We need self-control to guide us into loving others as well, to show kindness and to be peaceable towards others, always taking the lower place, esteeming others above myself. Exercising self-control will always lead to bountiful fruits of the Spirit. And now these are the examples I put to the test, <laughs> which I share. So the first one was, um, it was Natalia and Olivia. I was around at Bethany's. And I think we were preparing for the, um, the ladies' boxes and doing stuff there. And, and they were quite loud, squabbling. I don't know if it was a real squabble or they were messing about, but they were really quite loud. And I told them to be quiet. <laughs> and Bethany was there. You know, they were her children. And it wasn't until afterwards I thought, I shouldn't have done that. And I did speak to Bethany about it, and she, she was fine. But the Spirit spoke to me. You know, they're not my children. I hope, I hope I don't do it again. <laughs> and then, after, you know, we've been locked up, haven't we, all, most of last year. And so, when you let out, you don't always behave as you should. <laughs> 
And so in one day, I had a, an impulsive reaction, and then I managed to have a controlled reaction straight after that. So that was quite good, a half an hour. So, so yeah, I, what happened was, got into, no, it wasn't an argument, nothing like that, but I sort of spoke out of turn, and I felt bad. <laughs> and and, it, and I, I, I really felt bad about it, and I, and I guess the Lord convicted me. Because I've got in my mind, I want to have self-control, it, it's almost like it follows you around. And, and as soon as you, so at one time I would have perhaps done that and wouldn't have battered an eyelid and just carried on. But it, yeah, and I just thought, oh, it felt really uncomfortable. Um, and then within half an hour, something else occurred. And I let it go. <laughs> and I felt, I felt like I'd achieved, it, you know, through listening to the Holy Spirit, God had spoken to me. And, you know, it felt, felt quite good <laughs> not, not to retaliate. And so it was, so I call that an impulsive reaction and a controlled reaction. In Proverbs 10, 19, it, it does say, In a multitude of words, sin is not lacking. But who, he who restrains his lips is wise. I want to be wise. <laughs> so other voices to confuse the leading of the spirit. Now, good friends and family can be full of suggestions of what they believe is best for me. They may be right. They may be wrong. The important thing to remember is what God wants, not what I want and not what others want. And I think that, you know, you just have to uh, go through that and think and really come before the Lord. And, and because we can be influenced, can't we? Really be influenced sometimes. And, and then you want to please someone. Or, or, and I think you've just really got to remember that you want to please, you just really want to please the Lord. And that has happened. That's happened to me. So, and so we need self-control not to act on impulse to please others or ourselves, but to please God. <coughs> and that also is something that we can do to others. You know, we can have good intentions and we can think what's good for them, what's best for them. And it's good to encourage people. But also, we need those people to um, understand that, uh, that we are only trying to help, but it's, it's what God wants for them. So I think we have to be careful sometimes that we don't try and force our opinion or, or, or whatever on them. And I'm so thankful God doesn't say, off you go and do your best. <laughs> and that we have the help of the Holy Spirit within us. And praying for the gifts of the Spirit, I feel, is so important. And pray for the, for the wisdom and discernment are absolutely excellent gifts. And I think we need that when we're interacting with other people. So my last um, example is dealing with weaknesses. And this is about Samson. And his story can be found in Judges 13, 15. He was born a Nazarite. He was set apart with supernatural power and strength by the Spirit of the Lord. He was chosen by God to be a judge during a time of oppression. Samson had great physical strength, but his undoing was his weakness for the ladies. And he falls in love with Delilah, who manages to find out his source, the source of his strength. She then betrayed him into the hands of the Philistines, who gouged out his eyes and humiliate, humiliated him. What a way to end up, after clearly being called and used by God sad story. Samson had little or no self-control during parts of his life, running wild with his own desires. Samson's strength wasn't in his hair. His strength was from the Lord. His weakness wasn't when his hair was cut. His weakness was always there. He just allowed it to rule over him. But God, he gave him a second chance. Samson sacrificed his own life to bring down the enemy of his people. He's mentioned as a hero of faith in the book of Hebrews, along with David, Moses, Gideon, and many more. And it's not over when we make a mistake. And with God, there's always a second chance, and a third chance, and a fourth chance, and many, many more. In Philippians 1.6, it says, 
being confident of this very thing, he who has begun a, war, a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. And that's a wonderful, wonderful promise because he started this work and he'll finish it. Shall we pray? Father, I do thank you. I thank you for the spirit of self-control. Lord, I thank you for each lady here. Father, I pray that you would speak to their hearts, that you would be with them as they learn how to walk in the spirit and to know you're with them each hour of every day. Lord, teaching and guiding them. Lord, I pray for each lady that they would have an excellent spirit within, the spirit of God more abundantly, Lord, so they can carry out your will. We ask these things in your name, Father. Just Amen. You calm the storm that surrounds me. Just one word, then darkness has to retreat. greater thing